So certainly I do, I do preach a message of individual responsibility um, and limited government and where government acts, I, I think we should try to do it as well as possible. And I think we haven't done that here in this space. Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. And that intro, of course, is Hester Peirce with the SEC. I know a lot of people are frustrated with her. They think she's just playing along in a role of good cop, bad cop. All right, John Deaton was live today. Yeah, with Ellie and Charles Gasparino. Now at the 31 minute mark, it got very interesting. John tried one more time to persuade Gasparino that the SEC ethics chief had warned Hinman that he is not allowed to have any calls or meet with his law firm, that he is without a shadow of a doubt barred from doing that. But we know with the emails that Hinman went ahead and met anyway. Gasparino still remains skeptical. I just don't know why he is pushing back so hard. I only can think that he's aligned himself so strongly with Jay Clayton that he refuses to admit that it could have even been possible. But these emails do prove it anyway. Okay, so this next clip is seriously unbelievable. You're going to hear from the former SEC commissioner, Mr. Snappy Robert Jackson, answer the question that took place at UC Berkeley Law School yesterday, how are fines and settlements actually determined by the SEC? Listen very carefully. Um, can you talk a little bit about the sort of fines, how they are assessed, um, what type of settlement you might actually come to so that you can just resolve it and move on rather than getting into a public debate? That first of all, I hope whoever's listening to this, you're never even in this situation <laughs> where you have a Wells notice and you're worried about the SEC and the staff and you feel they're being aggressive and your lawyer wants to write crazy things. I hope you never reach that stage. But if you do, 95 plus percent of the time, the case will settle. And the reason it'll settle is, first of all, the SEC is not in the business of interfering with American entrepreneurship. So to the degree that you're at a growing, exciting company, the Securities and Exchange Commission doesn't want to stop you from creating jobs and growing the company. What they want to do is make sure you obey the law. And for that reason, the staff will often seek constructive settlement, and you'll almost certainly be able to strike one. It probably won't be a settlement that you or your lawyers love. That's what makes it a settlement, actually. It's a compromise between the position of the government and the position of the company. But often it's the case that the staff will proactively reach out to you or ask your lawyer, how can we work this out? And I'll tell you, there are a few things uh, that will guide those conversations. The first, as, as Colleen points out, is there will be civil fines and penalties, as the case may be, depending on the particular provision of the securities law you violated, depending on whether the, the company has had issues with the SEC before. I can tell you something that very often plays a crucial role in the setting of those fines is the level of cooperation that the company um, uh, has exhibited in connection with the investigation. Many companies are thoughtful and responsive and hire really reasonable lawyers who engage with the staff. Other companies hire people who yell for a living. And those companies, in my experience, tend to pay higher fines because they made the government's task harder. And I'll tell you, as a commissioner, I voted for those higher fines. So he voted for those higher fines. That is what we call vindictive, a strong reasoning desire for revenge the action of hurting or harming someone in return. Despicable behavior. Okay, moving right along. I've had the marketing director for the company Novati on the channel. They're located in Australia. They're a big payments company. They are also uh, a new bank with a uh, newly obtained banking license. And I saw something quite interesting on their website. They are tapping the on-demand liquidity since 2021. Now that uses the digital asset XRP in the remittance flows. And this is what you find on their partners page. Ripple is their remittance partner, while Stellar, you can see there at the bottom, is their technology partner. 
It was in November 2022 that Novati launched their Australian dollar stablecoin on the blockchain rails of Stellar. And that leads me to my second point. You've probably heard of the Ukrainian bank that, that is building the programmable money on the Stellar rails. Well, it was this global technology company, BIT, that was chosen to build the, the technology and they chose to build on the Stellar rails. Now, BIT is got their fingers into so many pilot programs with CBDCs around the globe. This is a global technology group you need to watch. Now, I know there's a lot of people on this channel that hold XLM, uh, maybe want to buy more XLM or are thinking about making changes to holding XLM. And it is a for sure controversial topic for this channel because I have been in search of uh, an XLM use case of late. Now, I know they used to use it in their remittance flows, but lately they have uh, shifted their focus. That's just for fact here, they've just shifted their focus to using the USDC uh, stablecoin, which has been issued by Circle. And uh, the world wire has been disbanded by IBM many years ago when they let Jesse Lund go and everyone else in that department was disbanded and they moved over to Hyperledger. Now, you can argue all you want, but before you argue with me, do your research. And I will continue to look at Stellar and look at their use cases and try to find where they are actually using the digital asset over and above their mm, securing the network. Now, I know they're going to implement smart contracts really soon, and that's very promising. So don't get me wrong. My eyes are open. I am watching. And there is a webinar for the Stellar Development Foundation Q4 2022 in review that's going to take place on Tuesday, January 31st. I'm definitely going to attend. I really uh, encourage you to do the same so that you don't have to rely on anyone except yourself to find out what is going on with Stellar and their use of the digital asset XLM outside of just securing their network. There was an article that just came out a couple of moments ago about Pakistan and Egypt at risk of currency crisis. I thought, okay, that's an interesting story. Let's give it a read. Look what I came across. This company has changed their business model. They're charging now a monthly subscription fee to read their articles. Now, if they were really an outstanding media group, I would consider $10 a month, but oh, trust notes, you gotta be kidding me, no way. The media in this space is pretty bad. You know, um, I agree with Charles Hoskins and Cardano. He talked about how the incentives are misaligned and I agree. Um, I'd love to see, even though he has had his beef with the XRP community, I'd love to see him buy uh, Coindesk because he at least will probably bring a little more fair uh, and balanced view and talk about a company in this space that's not giving a fair and balanced view. That would be the Daily HODL. And I really want to break a story or at least push someone else who I work with to uh, break a story of something that this media company has done. I can tell you firsthand, they are not fair and balanced. There's a few of us in the space that write a free monthly article for the lighthouse. I have an exclusive video that supplements that article. Here's a sneak peek. This will be released February 1st. Bastian Van Rokel, the co-founder of on xrp.com and an early recipient of a Ripple grant was in Tokyo in January and attended an NFT event where he had some insightful takeaways. I asked him, what did he find unique to the NFT market? His answer was in Japan, the NFT market is more regulated than in other countries, meaning there are more rules for trading NFTs. Japan's art is also unique. It's expressive and has a clear theme and direction. All right, everybody, we're jumping to the fluff. Yes, this is when everybody goes to the Jiko Kudani Snow Monkey Park. <laughs> it's the time of year that the Japanese low mountain monkey soaks in the hot springs. 
over the past few days, they've had a lot of snow and the babies are just adorable. Yeah, we even might get a few flakes tonight in Tokyo. They are so used to people. You can get very close to them. They just ignore you. They're not like the monkeys that you find in Gibraltar. I remember going there and, oh my gosh, they jump on your head and they try to take your earrings and steal your phone. <laughs> These monkeys just ignore you. They're more, they're more into their relaxation. You can see here the amount of serious photography going on. I never get tired of looking at all the photographs. All right, everybody, just do take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.